Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a great pleasure um, discussing this year's In Gold We Trust report with Jim Rickards again. Um, Jim is safely back from Mount Denali. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to discussing the, the key takeaways of this year's In Gold We Trust report. As you might know, it's quite a brick again. Um, there is massive inflation in terms of um, the length of our report. So this year it's 240 pages and there's lots of topics to discuss and I'm really looking forward to talking about the report and, 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 and uh, your views on, on our um, ideas with you, Jim Ricketts. Thanks for, for, for taking the time. Well, thank you for inviting me, Ronnie. It's great to be with uh, you and Mark and looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Well, um, as, as you might know, uh, we're writing the In Gold We Trust report for, for 12 years now. Um, um, the Wall Street Journal once said it's the gold standard of gold research. Um, it is available totally for, for, for free uh, on our webpage, ingoldwetrust.com. Report, Jim. You just recently said um, in an interview with um, Anglo Far East, um, with Alex Stanchik, uh, they produce um, um, they produce this once a year, but spend a whole year working on it. They're always gathering material, doing research, gathering interviews, talking to experts, etc. Well, um, it's it's totally right. We we sometimes feel like in a distillery where we distill all the material, all the, the books, the reports, the newspaper articles um, that we are reading uh, in a year. We're also dis distilling all the discussions that we're having with politicians, economists, asset managers, but also taxi drivers or Uber drivers nowadays um, talking about money, the economy, and so on. Um, and so, as I've said, this year it's 240 pages, quite a brick, but we feel that this year's um, edition is, yeah, um, um, quite, quite a success. Uh, again, um, we're touching on, 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 on very interesting topics, and this year the, the leitmotiv of the report is the turning of the monetary tide, and this is what we will be talking about going forward. Of course, um, the report nowadays is a, is a big project. Um, there is altogether um, 12 people involved with, you know, crunching the numbers, digging up research, um, preparing charts, translating, layouting, um, doing social media and so on. So we're really glad that we have got um, the cream of the crop uh, from the gold industry supporting us. You can see our premium sponsors because without those sponsors, it wouldn't be possible to publish this report for free. For us, as you know, it's also important to really kind of educate um, people about um, our monetary system, the consequences um, and the dangers um, that we are facing because of our monetary system and because of uh, inflationism that we are seeing in the market. So thanks to our premium partners. Um, the executive summary of the report, and this is basically what we will be discussing now with Jim, um, it is first of all the, the three tides that are turning. First of all, the tide um, in monetary policy is changing. We're seeing a U-turn from QE to QT, and this is the first big crash test for markets in 10 years. The second one is the turn of the tide in a global monetary architecture. Um, the de-dollarization is happening. We've got a fantastic interview with Luke Groman in our report um, discussing the de-dollarization. And the third one is the turn of the tide in technological progress, something where uh, uh, a topic that Jim also um, is very vocal about. Um, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies, and how that might um, have to do with gold, if gold and cryptos are foes or friends. Of course, 
We're also discussing inflationary and deflationary forces all acting together at the moment. Um, our incrementum inflation signal just switched to maximum strength so for the first time in a couple of months. Um, we're seeing um, strongly rising inflation based on the signal. However, we can also see that deflationary forces are getting very strong again too, of course, with quantitative tightening, but also with a, the recent strength in the US dollar and so on. We're writing about um, gold mining shares. We are putting in our thoughts about uh, technical analysis. And as I've said, we've got two exclusive interviews. One with um, Luke Roman, as mentioned, and the second one is, is with um, Richard Zundrich, who is the nephew of Friedrich August von Hayek. And as you, as you know, Hayek wrote about the denationalization of money already a couple of decades ago. So we're um, talking with his nephew, who is always also one of the leading experts on the work of, of Hayek. Um, we're talking um, uh, with him what he would say, think uh, or what his, what his uncle uh, Hayek would be um, saying about cryptos, if he would welcome that development or if he would be against it. So, yeah, plenty of topics to discuss. Jim, the first, um, the first tide that we will be talking about is the monetary tide. And we are quoting our friend uh, Franz Lischka, who said, people vastly underestimated the power of QE and they are in danger of doing the same with QT. So we can see this year for the first time in 10 years, we're going on a global basis, basically from a quantitative easing to a quantitative tightening mode. Um, the Federal Reserve started that process. Um, this uh, quarter, uh, it will already be 40 billion per month. Next year, next quarter, it will already be 50 billion per, per month. So altogether, the tightening will be 420 billion 2018 and 600 billion in 2019 and 2020. So um, I, I, I think um, that, as the quote said before, people completely underestimate the consequences of quantitative tightening because it's not only um, the Federal Reserve that is uh, becoming more restrictive, more hawkish. It is also the European Central Bank. It is the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, um, the Swedish Reichsbank and so on. So this might really be a big crash test for the market. Jim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. I'll uh, jump in on that topic. But before I do, I just want to add for about 30 seconds one more uh, compliment to the In Goal We Trust report, which is not only is it everything you described, comprehensive, uh, thorough, uh, something uh, your team works on for the entire year, read by you know, millions of, of downloads, et it's all of that. But also, it's critical to understand no one else is doing this because you take any other monetary topic, you could research it and publish a report, but central banks are publishing, finance ministries are publishing, the BIS, the IMF, their uh, think tanks, et cetera. There are lots of other people contributing. That's not true in gold. Um, ever since 1974, uh, you know, that period 71 to 74 when gold was demonetized, central bankers and others have stopped thinking about gold as a monetary asset. So they don't devote any research time to it. It's not taught in any academic um, economics program. Gold is not taught as a monetary asset. You can go to mining college and learn about it, or you can study uh, economic history. But the point is, not only is, is this um, the Gold We Trust report indispensable and comprehensive, it's the only thing of its kind. There's nowhere else. I mean, a few Wall Street firms do gold research, but they're really just sort of promoting, you know, gold stocks. But to really understand gold as a monetary asset, this is uh, not just the best source, it's almost the only source. So I wouldn't um, underestimate the, the gap that you're filling uh, in terms of global knowledge about the subject. So it, it's very, very important. Certainly, uh, I can't wait till it comes out every year. So Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. You, you, you're welcome. Let, let's go back to uh, QT. First of all, I, I agree completely 
um, with your introductory remarks, but let's just take it a step further. It's important to understand this has never happened before. Quantitative tightening is unprecedented. It's an experiment. The Fed has no idea what they're doing. When I say they have no idea what they're doing, I don't say that as a disparaging remark in terms of their abilities and talents, et cetera. It's just a statement of fact. And I uh, discussed this with uh, Ben Bernanke. He described QE to me as an experiment. QE had never been done before. Yeah, sure, central banks have had open market operations and they slightly uh, tighten or ease at the short end of the curve by buying and selling short term treasury obligations. But the idea of, of multi trillion dollar acquisitions of um, uh, long maturity assets uh, had never been done before, and therefore the unwinding of that is completely unprecedented. So, so you need to approach the subject with a lot of humility. Are we underestimating the impact? Absolutely, but we, we don't even know how much we're underestimating it because this is, has never been done before. So the, the simplest way to begin thinking about it, and again, things are not always symmetric, but just think about it symmetrically. symmetrically. What was the impact of QE? Well, it did not drive economic growth. Economic growth, I'll, I'll speak to the United States, but this is true globally. Uh, let's, go, let's go back for the last nine years. So the last recession ended in June 2009. Uh, here we are in the summer of 2018. So it's been over nine years, one of the longest expansions in the U.S. economic history, by the way, but also the weakest expansion in, in economic history. So maybe QE1... I would put QE1 in a separate category. That was an, a not inappropriate uh, emergency liquidity response to a liquidity crisis. That's what central banks are supposed to do. But QE2 and QE3 were pure experiments. There was no liquidity crisis in, um, in 2010 when the Fed uh, launched QE2. Uh, it was just a, an effort to um, – I mean, what, what Bernanke thought he was doing – he said, uh, we'll, um, we'll make uh, intermediate term treasuries really unattractive. We'll buy so many and keep the yield so low that people will not find them attractive assets. They will go to other asset classes. This was called the portfolio channel effect. You'll take your portfolio and channel it somewhere else because we're going to buy, we the Fed are going to buy so many 10 year notes that you're not going to want to own them yourself. And uh, that worked. Okay, so then what are the other channels? Real estate, stocks, you know, commodities, et cetera. Now, what Bernanke thought would happen is that they thought they would inflate, inflate asset values, which they did. But then he was relying on something called the wealth effect, which is, uh, okay, my asset values go up. I, I get my 401k statement or I'm a portfolio manager and I look at my assets going up and I'm making money and everyone feels richer because we've inflated asset values. And then you go out and spend more money and you're more confident about borrowing more money or the increased value of the assets act as collateral to support more borrowings. So Bernanke, it was sort of a, in pool what we call a three cushion bank shot. What Bernanke thought he was doing is basically make 10 year notes, uh, intermediate term uh, government assets unattractive by holding the yield down, force uh, savings into other channels such as stocks and real estate, those would then be those would then create a wealth effect, be used for collateral, get more borrowing, get more spending, get velocity up, and uh, everyone live happily ever after. That would get the economy back to trend growth. The first part happened. Asset values were inflated, but the second part did not happen, mainly because the wealth effect is is illusory. It's a, it's a psychological phenomena. It's not something you can quantify. People were so um, burdened, so beaten down, so really fearful of what happened in 2008, bearing in mind that came along not that long after the 2000 dot-com crash. So we had, you know, NASDAQ went down 85% after the dot-com crash in 2000, 2001, and then down another uh, 60% uh, along with the major indices um, in 2008. So you had two mega crashes in an eight-year period, at which point consumers were just saying to themselves, this could happen again tomorrow. And, and they're right about that. It hasn't happened, but uh, certainly the danger is there. And so nobody spent the money. Nobody borrowed the money. The banks didn't lend. Uh, customers didn't borrow. People didn't spend. The velocity effects and the, uh, the expected wealth effect never appeared. So you got the asset inflation, and by the way, I'm not, as you know, I'm not a, I have great respect for Austrian economics. I don't hold myself out as an Austrian economist, but uh, you know better than I do, uh, Ronnie, that um, 
uh, Austrian economists posit two kinds of inflation. There's consumer price inflation, but there's also asset inflation. And you have to always bear that in mind when you're talking about the impact of money supply on prices. Um, so we got the asset inflation, but we did not get the spending, lending, increased velocity, and return to trend growth that Bernanke expected. So there we are. So now we go all the way through QE3. Uh, we have the, the taper, which took another year from uh, 2013 to 2014. And then finally, in December 2015, uh, Janet Yellen starts to raise interest rates, and then they've been on that path ever since. So that's the history. Now, when we turn to QT, what should we expect? Well, if the effect of QE was to inflate asset prices, the effect of QT might be expected to deflate asset prices. And we're seeing that. The uh, U.S. stock market peaked on January 26th. Again, here we are uh, mid-summer uh, uh, of, of 2018, and the peak was January 26, 2018, uh, uh, six months ago. So uh, is the stock market going to crash tomorrow? Not necessarily, and I'm not forecasting that. But it's interesting that right around the time QT started, the stock market ran out of steam. And we're seeing evidence from all over the world that real estate markets are running out of steam. So, you know, if everything happens at the margin, things don't happen overnight, you know, you need to be patient and make sure your time series are long enough and substantial. But as, as I see it, um, if the impact of QE was to inflate asset values, the impact of QT will be to deflate asset values. So we should expect, um, stock markets to you know trend sideways and then eventually go down significantly as the fed tightens now you always have to in forecasting you always have to think about the reaction function it's it's like playing chess it's if you think two moves ahead you'll lose every time you need to think three three moves ahead or if you're you know gary kasparov maybe you can think four moves ahead it gets pretty daunting after that but the point being um as the fed tightens uh, by reducing the money supply they uh, don't know what they're doing. Uh, they should expect to be surprised. One of the surprises will be this uh, slowing of the economy and the flattening or even decline of asset prices. They may back off from that at some point, but that's they're not ready to do that. They're, they're very determined to keep raising rates. Uh, as of now, I would expect that they will raise rates again in September. Um, that could change, but uh, that's that's kind of the way it looks from here. So I think investors are in for a rough ride because the Fed is basically taking the air out of bubbles. That, that, that's very interesting what, what you're saying because that's also one of the, the key takeaways from, from our report we, because we say people often – tend to expect too much from gold at the moment because, you know, on the surface, equity markets are still doing okay, bond markets is doing okay, real estate market all over the globe, volatility is is, is still pretty low, although we have seen some some um, some um, stress uh, in January, February, but all in all, the, the, the general view is, is still pretty much okay, but it seems that um, um, central bankers and, and, and also the White House is getting a bit concerned. Just three three examples. I think uh, one of the most important developments of the last couple of weeks um, that the White House actually pressured the Fed to ease on the rate hikes and not worry too much about inflation, um, which is something that we probably haven't seen since the Nixon administration. So Larry Kudlow, he said, my hope is that they understand that and that they will move very, very slowly. Then there was um, Bullard um, from, what, what is it, um, Fed St. Louis, I it's think. St. Louis, yep, right. Um, he warned against uh, aggressively um, uh, raising uh, uh, interest rates. And then I think um, this might also have to do with um, with the, the, the devaluation of the renminbi. Um, an, a number that we are following very closely is the money supply M1 in China. It is, from our point of view, the, 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 the best leading indicator for China. And it was falling off a cliff in recent months. Now, I think it's interesting that the PBOC is actually the first major central bank that is starting this U-turn already. So they are again changing to a more accommodative monetary policy. So from our point of view, this, this realization that actually 
um, raising interest rates aggressively and 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 doing quantitative tightening uh, in such an over levered um, um, uh, environment um, that this is pretty harmful and, and dangerous and when this u turn comes, I think this might be the real 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 trigger um, for gold going forward and also of course for for, for other asset classes but mark um, uh, I, I think this chart is is, is, is is a chart that you like in particular so perhaps you want you want to say some 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 things about this chart. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. Um, I think, I mean, a lot of things you already have touched. We, we've talked about quantitative tightening. This is also indicated on, on this chart. We see, A, the balance sheet, how it developed during the last 15 years. Uh, we see, B, the gold price, and C, additionally to that, also um, Fed fund rates. And, and Fed funds rates have been, have been rising since the end of 15 and especially started t taking on uh, some pace um, at the beginning of 2017. And so this is kind of double-sided double, double uh, sided, uh, monetary tightening, and this is just uh, something which actually amplifies probably the effect of, of, of the balance sheet shrinking. So gold is holding up relatively well uh, uh, considering this headwinds this is basically what we are want to say with this chart any thoughts Jim yeah no I agree with that completely um, you know people say why isn't gold higher and one of my questions is why isn't gold lower um, considering the uh, uh, we're getting a double barrel shot of tightening the Fed is actually raising rates which is unquestionably tightening and then they're reducing the balance sheet soon at a, a tempo of six hundred billion dollars a year, completely unprecedented. Uh, the best estimates I've seen are that the um, the, the tempo of Fed um, balance sheet reduction is equivalent to a one percentage point hike in the Fed funds rate per year. So, if you can do that translation, and again, this is um, uh, these are estimates; no one knows exactly, but I think it's a good estimate. So, you could say that the Fed is tightening. Um, two percentage points a year, not one. If they do four meetings at 25 basis points each, that's the basic tempo. But if you uh, translate the balance sheet reduction into another four 25 basis point uh, rate hikes, they're actually hiking 50 basis points every meeting. I think that's a better way to think about it, an easier way to think about it. So that is that is an extreme form of tightening. Uh, yeah, okay, the PC core deflator finally after six years got to 2%. I mean, think about it. The, the, the central bank tries for six years to get that number to 2% and they fail. And then finally it gets there. And obviously some of that are like kind of knock on effects some oil and higher gasoline prices and a few other things. Uh, there were some base effects from cellular data plan services, although they're coming down again. So I don't think they're gonna to stick to that. I don't think they're gonna stick that 2%. I think that's probably gonna turn around, but we'll see. You know, that's that's something we can take one month at a time. But the point is that's that's how hard They've had to work just to get inflation even close to their goal after six years of, of failure. So um, I, I don't see uh, um, now that they're going to do this uh, double dose of tightening, uh, it's it's going to get a lot a lot worse. So the point being, uh, the fact that gold is held, held up as well. My my view is that gold entered a long term bull market in uh, December 2015. That that 1050 you know in U.S. dollars that 1050 per ounce low of December. Uh, 2015 marked the end of the bear market that began in 2011. So you had that you know four and a half year bear market. We're now in a bull market. I understand gold has backed off uh, recently, but it's still up 20% uh, from that uh, from that target uh, sorry, from that level, and I expect it will continue to go up. So to me, that's phenomenal considering the headwinds. One other point, just to you know, and Ronnie and Mark, you outlined how um, the the Fed balance sheet tightening. May if balance sheet reduction may constitute over tightening. One by one, central banks may realize this. They may have to back off from it. Maybe PBOC is the canary in the coal mine, and we're looking at a prospect of you know six months or a year from now, the Fed actually saying, you know, we made a mistake. Uh, we're going to take a pause um, in our in our rate hikes, and maybe we're going to reduce the tempo of balance sheet reduction. So that when that happens. They'll be throwing in the towel. They'll be admitting that they cannot normalize the balance sheet. They cannot normalize yeah. interest rate. Uh, 
and that's going to be a major spike for gold. We have a an idea that comes out of U.S. advertising. I'm not sure if it was ever very popular in Europe, but there was a product a few decades ago called the Roach Motel, and it was basically a, a way of killing cockroaches if you had them in your uh, in your apartment or whatever. And it was a little box, and it was like some insect poison inside. And the commercial was roaches go in, but they can't get out. Um, and ever since then, Roach Motel is sort of a metaphor for something that you get into and you can't get out of. The Fed and other major central banks, maybe in a Roach Motel, they did all this easing, uh, they did all this QE, they cut, they did zero interest rate policy, but it's it's starting to look like they can't get out, they can't normalize. And every time they try, they slow the economy. But that's By the way, that's why we had QE1, 2, 3. Why, why didn't we stop at QE1? Well, the answer is every time they stopped, they slowed the economy, and then they had to start it up again. So we may just be setting the stage for uh, for QE4. Yeah, right. So if I just may finish up, we, you actually took away the, our, our next slide, which was on page 8. Uh, Ronnie put it up in the meantime while, while you were talking. So if you just could move back shortly, Ronnie, please. Yeah. Yeah, right. So that's basically what you said, Jim. Right. And uh, when when will they stop uh, the tightening? What, what we also wanted to do here is like give give people a quick reminder because most of the time when you're stuck in the markets, you're really focused on a short time period and time horizon, and it's it's quite difficult to 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 remember what happened two, three, or even five, six, seven, or eight years ago. And it's amazingly has been almost eight years since QE. One was finished, and I, I remember pretty well that we're talking about normalization and exit plan back then already. Um, but it 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 came very dif uh, differently. So we had all these paths, which actually were kind of um, announced or not officially announced, but kind of indicated. But they they always uh, postponed the tightening. Uh, until until that finally came to it uh, this year. Uh, so just a quick reminder, things can turn out differently as, as, as predicted and as announced, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and this one to finish up basically this, this chapter of the monetary turning of the monetary tide, even a, a longer perspective of, of, of the Fed fund rates, a 100 plus year uh, chart of our of of the fed fund rates which shows some very interesting um correlations obviously to to recessions i mean that's probably not a big surprise to most of the listeners uh rising rates may trigger a recession but that it's like that often was was even surprising to me it's like from from the last um 20 hiking cycles um, 17 actually or 16 have have triggered a, a recession only three of them we marked them with a circle didn't so we are in hiking cycling number 17 and we're gonna see what will be the result obviously uh, sooner or later the recession will will be uh, will break in that's at least our conviction you know uh, mark that's a very important point but just to drop a footnote if you take uh the, the the red circle uh, between 14 and 15, uh, where you say, okay, here was one tightening cycle that did not cause a U.S. recession. That's correct, but it did cause a um, financial markets panic. This is when um, uh, Orange County, one of the largest, richest counties in the United States, went bankrupt yeah. uh, and also triggered the Mexican um, uh, peso crisis, the so-called tequila crisis. So, okay, it, didn't, it did not cause a U.S. recession, but it did cause major market disruption, major market losses, and an emerging markets uh, sovereign debt crisis specific to Mexico. So uh, it has bad effects, even if uh, U.S. recession is not one of them. You could get both right now. With this tightening cycle, you could get a U.S. recession and a dollar-denominated emerging markets debt crisis. And we already see the signs of that. I mean, uh, Turkey is hanging by a thread. That's a that's a huge, huge, you know, $500 billion potential loss and no one wants to talk about. And of course, Argentina has already hit the wall and just got bailed out by the IMF. Uh, Brazil is perhaps not too far behind. So we're seeing 
a lot of signs of an emerging, if you want to include China, I mean, China is the world's second largest economy, but technically still an emerging or developing economy. Uh, so we're seeing that uh, emerging markets debt crisis emerge and um, U.S. economic growth slowing. I understand the second quarter is going to be strong. I mean, we, we all know that. But that, uh, first of all, looks like a one-time effect from some of the early stimulus of the Trump tax cuts, which will not last. And, and number two, we've had 4 and 5% quarters before in this long, uh, as I said, nine-year expansion, very weak expansion beginning in 2009. We've seen these 4 and 5% quarters before, and they always fade. So, all right, I'll, I'll you know credit where it's due. It looks like the U.S. economy is going to expand around 4% in the second quarter, but there's no assurance that that's going to stick. And it, it, it already looks like um, a kind of a one-time uh, one-time effect. Yeah, Jim. Just just a couple of uh, uh, further further statistics on that. Um, uh, Dr. Lacey Hunt, uh, 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 one of my most favorite favorite economists, he he's pointing out, for example, that um, since since the early 1900s, money supply M2 decelerated prior to um, 17 of the 21 recessions. Now, in the first half of the year, it has collapsed to above, uh, to, 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 to below 2%. Um, so this, this is another sign, I think, that, that makes us um, pretty certain that recession risks are significantly higher than the market sees at the moment, uh, another statistic by Dave Rosenberg, um, another uh, uh, economist that I highly like. He, he just said, coming back to your point before, if the Fed raises rates and shrinks the balance sheet as much as it says it will, the cumulative de facto tightening by the end of 2019 will have totaled 525 basis points. If you don't think this is enough to cause a recession, take note that the Fed tightened 425 basis points from 2004 to 2006, 350 basis points prior to the 2000 downturn, and by nearly 400 basis points in the lead up to the 1990 pullback. So uh, to, to, to put it in a nutshell, from our point of view, nobody is really seeing a recession coming up. Uh, we have uh, brought up this, this chart from Bloomberg where they question um, the most important and influential economists all over the globe. And for the next three years, zero, nobody of them is expecting a recession. Now, what does it have to do with gold? Of course, gold profits from recessions. We, we, we crunched the numbers and we came, uh, came up uh, with the conclusion that on average, in the last recessions since the year 1973, gold was up 20% in the course of a recession. So people always wonder why, why do you discuss macro so much in your gold report? From our point of view, it's really important to discuss gold from a portfolio perspective because we know in the course of a recession, not so many asset classes do really well and gold is one of the very few asset classes that really um, profits from recessions. So as I've said, I think we all agree the recession, it doesn't necessarily mean that we, we're going to see a recession 2019, but I think the risks are significantly higher than, than um, the mainstream is, is, is discounting at the moment. Right. I, I agree with that, Ronnie. And also one other thing uh, I would point out in your chart of rising interest rates in U.S. recessions. Uh, yeah, this pattern of rising rates before recession is very clear and a couple exceptions you pointed out, but it, it's a very strong pattern. But look at the um, sequence from uh, number 13 to uh, you have 17 question mark, even just number 16. Um, the, first of all, the pattern persists, but you have what technicians call um, – uh, lower highs, in other words, each spike yeah. is lower than the one before. Um, and so where we are now, you don't have to see interest rates get up to, you know, six, seven, eight, nine percent before it causes a recession. If, if this pattern persists, uh, and it, it's very strong, it's driven by demographics, by the way. There, there is something mm -hmm. behind this. It's not random. Uh, it's driven by demographics and technology and, and other 
um, other exogenous factors. But rates don't have to get to 6% to cause a recession. Yeah. And if that pattern persists, you just extend it, you get to 3%, uh, that could be enough. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, uh, on a relative basis, um, the Federal Reserve has much more, um, yeah, much more tools uh, in, in, in their toolbox than the ECB. Um, I think on, on, on a relative basis, the situation in the U.S. is significantly better because at least, you know, on average, I think in the last couple of recessions, um, interest rates were lowered by 500 basis points. Now, uh, if, if we do that in the, in the Eurozone, um, we're deeply in negative territory. However, let us continue with the second turning of the tide, the turning of the global monetary architecture. We are writing about the de-dollarization for a couple of years now, and it's also a big chapter in this year's report. Our mutual friend, Grant Williams, he said in this fabulous documentary, Gold, the Story of Man, Man's 6,000 uh, year obsession, um, probably one of the, the best documentaries ever made on gold. Um, Grant said, while the dollar has been the world's reserve currency for 40 years, that hasn't always been the case. The British pound, the Spanish, Spanish pesita, and even the Portuguese escudo at one point in history were all as mighty in their time as the dollar is today. Throughout history, when civilizations needed to finance expansion, they were constrained by their gold reserves. Now, of course, um, I think this de-dollarization that we're seeing at the moment is also, first of all, a consequence of, um, yeah, the, the, the dollar being the world's uh, reserve currency since, since the Bretton Woods Agreement. But also, I think this, this movement, um, this questioning of this uh, 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 privilege is also a consequence of the fiscal situation that the U.S. is in. And this is just a very basic debt chart. Uh, and we were quite astonished, actually, to, to study um, the, the um, analysis of the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, because they see um, 14 uh, trillion further, further deficits uh, for the U.S. in the next 10 years. But under the kind of naive or very optimistic assumption that there will be no recession at all in the next 10 years. So probably the, the, um, the projected deficit should be significantly higher in the US. Now, let's come to, the, to, to this chart that is uh, kind of telling us, um, kind of showing us what, what, what we're seeing, this uh, U-turn when it comes to um, um, central bank gold reserves. And we can see that um, developed markets, basically they, they at least stopped selling their gold reserve reserves while the rest of the world, especially emerging market countries, they are pretty aggressively buying gold at the moment. And this is uh, something that we can see on this chart. Now, Jim, I know this is a very, very important topic for you. You're also talking about the axis of gold. We're seeing um, China, Russia, Turkey, India, but also Iran, um, uh, countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, aggressively buying physical gold. Um, yeah, Jim, what's, what's the, the longer term strategy regarding um, official gold reserves in those emerging countries? And what does it have to do with uh, the de-dollarization? Um, great uh, question, uh, Ronnie, and probably the most, one of the most important monetary or geopolitical questions in the world today. So there are two things going on at once. They're related, but you can sort of analyze them separately and then uh, bring them together. The first is uh, what you referred to, which is a, um, a shift in the basis of the global um, internet, of the international monetary system. Some people refer to this as a reset or, you know, the big reset or global monetary reset. Um, I go back to a much older uh, description of it called the rules of the game. Uh, that phrase, the rules of the game, goes back at least 100 years, uh, maybe further. But it's how the monetary elites themselves 
refer to or understand how the monetary system works. They call it the rules of the game, and everyone's supposed to know what they are. They're not written down. It's not a treaty. Um, it's just how the system operates. The problem today, and I've had a couple conversations with this one with the, I mentioned Ben Bernanke, but also uh, had a very long one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with um, uh, John Lipsky. Uh, John is not uh, nearly as well known as uh, Bernanke uh, or you know Janet Yellen or Jay Powell for that matter, but he is uh, in the super elite category. John was the only American ever to head the IMF, um, and if you know the history there, uh, when the IMF was established at Bretton Woods in 1944, and then it took him a couple years to set it up, uh, the Europeans were uh, concerned that the U.S. had too much power. Obviously, the U.S. got pretty much everything it wanted. At Bretton Woods, we were on the dollar gold standard. All the other currencies were not technically linked to gold. They were linked to the dollar, and then the dollar was linked to gold. So you had an indirect linkage to gold, but you could devalue against the dollar. The one thing that was not supposed to happen was the dollar would devalue against gold, although, of course, eventually it did. But the point being, there was so much power concentrated in the U.S. that the Europeans said, well, we don't think an American should be the head of the IMF. You guys had too much power, and America agreed. So the deal was that an American would always head the World Bank, but a non-American, specifically European and mostly French, would always head the IMF. And that's been true ever since, with one exception, which is our friend, um, in 2011, our friend Dominic Strauss-Kahn got arrested on various uh, you know, sexual assault charges by the NYPD, hauled off an Air, Air France plane at JFK Airport. And the IMF had to resign a few days later, and the IMF executive board was literally not ready with a replacement. They didn't think they had to choose anyone. They eventually settled on Christine Lagarde. But John was the first deputy managing director at the time, the second most powerful position, and the highest one held by an American. So he had to step up as acting uh, managing director of the IMF, in effect, the head of the IMF. So the only American ever hold that position. I had a very long over an hour one-on-one -on -one conversation with him in, in Hong Kong um, just a couple of weeks ago. Fascinating. Uh, but he agrees that the system is incoherent. In fact, he used that word, um, that there is no anchor, uh, that we're just, we've got all these floating exchange rates, but everything can be described in reference to something else, some other form of money, but nothing can be described in reference to an objective standard. And of course, that's always the role that gold has performed. So I can talk about the euro dollar cross rate, or I can talk about the yuan dollar cross rate, or any other cross rate I want. But I have no basis for uh, assessing any currency in terms of something that's not another currency. Um, and so, as I said, there's there's no anchor. And you know, we're supposed to have this. Um, the euro is supposed to be a store of value. The dollar is supposed to be a store of value. If you look at the time series of the euro US dollar cross rate since 1999 when, when the euro was launched, uh, you've had six swings of 20% or more in both directions. Um, you know, the euro has gone from 80 cents to a dollar 60. Uh, you know, then went down to a dollar thirty, back up to a dollar forty-five, down to one hundred five, back up to one nineteen. Uh, what is that? The, these are the two two most important currencies in the world. They're supposed to represent stores of value, and yet they're swinging back and forth uh, in in very very large magnitudes. That's not any kind of um, stable system at all. And so that's that's what we have today. So the Chinese realize this, the Russians realize this, others realize it. They're saying, okay, what, what can we do to create stability? And of course, you just turn to gold because gold has, we don't have to belabor the point, gold has all the attributes uh, that we understand very well and it is a secure anchor for monetary systems. So that's one thing going on and that's what you're seeing in these charts. But the other thing is, is geopolitical, which is the U.S. is using and maybe even abusing uh, the the status of the dollar. Now, just to be clear, the dollar is six, approximately 60% of global reserves, 80% of global payments, and almost 100% of uh, oil pricing. Uh, so there's no doubt that the dollar dominates the international monetary system. Uh, and that would be, by itself, a cause for resentment in places like China and Russia that are trying to get out from under what I call U.S. dollar hegemony. But it's worse than that because the U.S. is using this status 
to impose economic sanctions on uh, Russia, China, and and other countries around the world. Now, how do we do this? Well, the first thing we and we've done this to Iran. We, we eased up at, during uh, the last couple of years of the Obama administration. Now it's back. We're putting what what the White House refers to as maximum pressure on Iran, maximum pressure on North Korea, and we're putting some substantial pressure, if not maximum pressure, on Russia and China and others. Now the list of grievances is long. You know, in the case of Russia. It's for you know taking Crimea and interfering in eastern Ukraine, uh, and probably some of these assassinations in the UK. Uh, in the case of China, it's theft of intellectual property and cyber warfare. In the case of Iran, it's their nuclear program. Same thing with North Korea, threats to Israel. So the U.S. has you know geopolitical reasons. Notice all the things I just mentioned are not monetary; they're geopolitical. But we're using monetary weapons. This is financial war. We are in a war, we the United States are in a war with Russia. We're in a war with Iran. We're in a war with North Korea and China today as we speak. It's not a kinetic war. It's not a shooting war. It's a financial war. And I'm not talking about the trade war. Trade war is a whole separate subject. We could spend a couple of hours on that. Uh, this is a financial war. So the first thing we do, we cut you out of the US dollar payment system. You could be your entire country in the case of Iran, or it could be uh, specific companies and specific individuals in the case of uh, Russia and China. So we say, you can't use the dollar payment system, which we completely control. Uh, if you want to pay me in dollars, uh, or if China wants to pay Iran in dollars for its oil, I guarantee those dollars at some point flow through U.S. banks and flow through something called the Fedwire or the New York Clearinghouse. Uh, and that is controlled ultimately by the Treasury and the Fed. That's the first thing we do. The second thing we do, if we want to play rough, is we de-SWIFT you. And of course, SWIFT is the uh, Belgian-based uh, international um, financial telecommunications network that handles all payments between countries in many, all the major currencies. So if Deutsche Bank wants to settle um, a, a Euro transaction with Citibank, that goes through SWIFT. If uh, Unicredit in Italy wants to settle, um, you know, it could be Swiss francs with uh, UBS, that goes through SWIFT. So we kicked Iran out of SWIFT um, in, in 2012 uh, and then into in 2013. Uh, and that's like cutting off the oxygen supply to a patient in intensive care. They die pretty quickly. We're, we're now, I mean, we haven't de swifted Iran, but we're, we're doing what are called secondary boycotts, which are saying, okay, you can do business with Iran, but if you do, you can't do business in the United States. So all the major, so even though the leaders of Europe, even though the uh, the other members of the of the G5 uh, plus one, um, or the uh, uh, yeah the the the, the non national Security Council five plus one, which is Germany, uh, except for the United States, want to continue to do business in Iran. The companies are not going along with the leadership because. They're afraid of sanctions in the U.S., and, and they should be. Um, and then, same thing with China, we're throwing on these uh, Section 301 tariffs for theft of intellectual property. So the whole world is watching this. They're saying, okay, uh, not only is the dollar, does the dollar dominate, which we don't like to begin with, but you're throwing your weight around. You're like a bully who shows up on the playground and just beats up all the other kids. What happens in that situation? Well, you can... You can beat up kids one by one, but eventually the kids form a gang and they come back and they beat up the bully. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing Russia, China, Turkey, and Iran. You've got India in your charts, which is very interesting. Iran is not transparent. We don't know how much gold Iran has. We do know that they've been getting as much as they can, as fast as they can. Some of it because Obama sent uh, some pallets of gold in a plane to Iran as part of the, the, the payoff for entering this joint comprehensive plan of agreement on the nuclear portfolio. But a lot of gold has come into Iran, transshipped through Dubai originally and later through Turkey, and Turkey's in this club. So China, Russia, Turkey, and Iran are what I call the new axis of gold. They are preparing for a non-dollar world. Mm -hmm. And they, they know that their local currencies are not going to be global reserve currencies. The Chinese yuan is the best of the lot, and that's at least 10 years away. And I, there's, a, there's a lot of infrastructure you need. You can't just wake up and be a global reserve currency. You need a bond market. You need repos. You need dealers. You need hedging tools. You need futures, options, et cetera. Yep. Plus, above all, you need the rule of law, which they don't have. But the uh, IMF SDR, which we can come back to, and gold itself are um, suitable candidates for uh, a global reserve. So that's exactly what we're saying. So it has a financial aspect which is the, predicting the demise of the dollar because of excessive U.S. dollar debt. 
which we cannot get out of. That is a Roche Motel. We're going to have to inflate or default. Uh, and the geopolitical aspect, which is they're sick of the U.S. Uh, pushing them around using the dollar payment system. So this is a very big deal. Yeah, uh, just just one number. I think in in the first quarter, uh, Iran's uh, gold demand more than more than tripled. So, um, so that's definitely uh, quite a lot going on. This this chart is also fascinating, um, um, and it, it I think it 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 it, it, it it refers to something that uh, Charles Garf just recently said on Macro Voices. I thought it was a fascinating statement. He said, you have to understand that the gold price is now a big play between the U.S. and China. So to a certain extent, the price of gold is going to tell you who is going to win in that effort to de-dollarize Asia. If gold goes up, it's China. If gold goes down, it is the U.S. Now, what we, what we have done in the in the report together with Luke Roman is uh, we had a look at um, the biggest uh, oil net exporters and their trading deals, their their supply uh, uh, deals, their oil supply deals, and their pricing. And it is, I think, it's it's really fascinating to see uh, how many agreements already have been made between China and many important oil exporters. Um, just as some sort of anecdotal evidence, I just attended the, uh, the World Mining Congress. I was a keynote speaker at the World Mining Congress in Kazakhstan, in Astana. Absolutely fascinating city. It, 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 it feels a bit like, I don't know, a, a combination of, of Singapore and, and New York and Las Vegas. Really, you wouldn't expect such a, such a, a city in, 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 in Kazakhstan. Uh, and at this Congress, it was really big, more than 3,000 delegates. Um, I think I've, I didn't see any U.S. American, but, I would say like 60 or 70 percent of the of the delegates and attendants were Chinese, and and from what I could tell, talking to 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 a minister from Kazakhstan as well, um, the the one belt one road is really a huge project, uh, a, a project that will probably be around for the next couple of decades. But really, having you know um, um, on the foot on the ground, you can tell that that. This de-dollarization is actually happening already, and I think this table um, confirms that pretty pretty well. Well, um, let's go to the third turning of the tide. It's the turning of the tide in technological progress. Um, I know that Jim is, is very, very vocal when, when it comes to, to Bitcoin. Um, you've made some, some, some really good calls on, on, on Bitcoin. Uh, you are pretty, pretty pessimistic, especially because it is, um, uh, you always said that, 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 uh, government control um, will be a major factor for prices that new legislation will be announced, uh, new restrictions and so on. You were totally right. But what we are referring to in the, in the gold report is actually some sort of the combination of gold and blockchain technology. And Peter Grosskopf, uh, he's the, the CEO of Sprott. He said something really good. He said, gold has always been criticized as being an inefficient product, a lazy product, a product that's hard to transact with. It's almost as though the blockchain were invented for gold. The marriage of the two, I think it's going to be incredibly powerful. So what, what we are kind of explaining in the report this year is uh, new projects coming up, um, projects, um, 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 joint ventures between established players from the market, for example, um, uh, Tradewind Market, which is Sprott, Gold Corp and IEX Group, um, together with the Royal Canadian Mint. Then there's another project called Royal Mint, Royal Mint Gold, uh, which is the UK's Royal Mint and CME Group, combining physical gold 
and blockchain technology. And from our point of view, this might, um, at the moment, that's very early stage, but I think going forward for the millennials, for the generation um, that basically, uh, 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 yeah, grew up with, uh, with smartphones and with, um, um, yeah, that grew up in a, in a kind of a more digital life than, than we, for example, I think for them it it it, it might um, be um, yeah. I, I think that the, the chances are not really high that they will actually go uh, into a bank or to a coin dealership and buy physical gold. But if you kind of um, prepare um, good technological solutions uh, for for millennials buying, storing, um, moving physical gold. Um, I think this, this might be a, a trigger for the gold market because it will also be mostly really physical gold that will be, will be, uh, uh, uh bought. So, Jim, um, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the crypto space, uh, in general, but also the combination of crypto and gold. Sure. Uh, and Ron, you've already, um, highlighted the the single most important point it's it's difficult for a lot of observers to um, sort of parse but it, it's absolutely critical you always have to separate the coin or the token whatever you want to call it from the underlying technology or the protocol uh, the coins and tokens have uh, the, at least the ones that are out there now and we'll, we'll let's come back to the gold sort of crypto gold or other forms of cryptocurrency that are, are yet to be announced uh, the ones that are out there are will eventually get to something close to zero. They they may kind of chug along at one hundred, two hundred dollars a coin. And you know, I understand perfectly. I, I actually have some friends who they went out and bought a um, thousand Bitcoin at a dollar a piece, and it wasn't that long ago when you could buy a thousand when you could buy Bitcoin for a dollar a piece. You know, it was a few years back, um, and they sold out close to the top. You know, kind of eighteen thousand dollars and they made um, 18 million dollars on that and uh, have lived happily ever after so there are real Bitcoin millionaires out there the, the the numbers speak for themselves you know when people were buying at 18,000 you have to remember somebody was selling right for it's a zero-sum game for every buyer there's a seller and so uh, the it, it was sort of but but then you say to yourself okay so there are people who have made you know uh, two million dollars ten million dollars there are people who made hundreds of millions of dollars I don't doubt that there are some honest to goodness Bitcoin billionaires out there but you have to ask yourself well how did you make the money did you create value did you create wealth I mean, Bill Gates is you know fabulously wealthy he's I don't know he's worth 70 80 billion dollars but as far as I'm concerned he earned every penny because he through his company through Microsoft created value that was far in excess of the money that he personally made so he he added value to the world, and so have a lot of other, you know, billionaires who you know Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, but not just them, but others. They they got rich by adding value. If you got rich on Bitcoin, you did not add any value. All it was was a wealth transfer from someone to you, uh, from you know Sharpies to some suckers to Sharpies, as I describe it. Um, so who was buying at fifteen, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars? Well, there were you know relatively poor Americans taking home equity loans out. There were South Korean you know uh, garage owners, uh, you know, car repair services hawking their inventory. Uh, there have been a certain number of suicides uh, as a result of this, and this is true all over the world. There's a lot of denial where people lost money and they're pretending it's going to come back and and all that. It was it was the greatest bubble in history, greater than the tulip bubble. It was mostly driven by fraud, a lot of which has to do with Tether, uh, which is one of these uh, so-called stable coins, except, you know, all the dollars that went into Tether are supposed to be worth a dollar. You know, one Tether is supposed to be worth one dollar. Where'd the dollars go? Well, they're not sitting in a vault somewhere. They went to buy Bitcoin to prop up the price. And when that unwinds, and that, that's the other shoe to drop probably later this year, uh, that's going to take the price of Bitcoin down and maybe into the triple digits, you know, a couple hundred dollars per coin. So it was a massive fraud, a massive Ponzi, no value added, wealth transfer, just a way to rip off uh, people who were, you know, maybe less uh, astute than yourselves in terms of, of the dynamics of this. And, um, you know, pretty much a, a disgrace. Um, and that's true of a lot of the other cryptocurrencies as well. Now, that said, let's go over to the blockchain technology. Something fancy. It's just it's just a, a ledger, right? So if I 
I can keep a ledger by hand if I want. And, you know, every bank in the world has digital ledgers. Uh, every uh, credit card company, every, you know, now property records, stock market, DTC. Uh, how do we keep track of buys and sells of, you know, IBM or Exxon stock in the stock exchange or Deutsche Bank or Unicred? Well, there are digital ledgers for all that. And they're heavily encrypted and, you know, relatively secure. Well, blockchain is, is simply that on a distributed basis. Distributed meaning it exists on computers and servers all over the world. It's not in one place. And in theory, it's trustless, although nothing's trustless. You're always trusting somebody. You're trusting a developer. You're trusting a protocol. You're trusting uh, that the government won't intervene. This, the, the idea of a trustless system is nonsense. Uh, so it's not that big a deal. It's, it's okay, a blockchain is um, a digital, encrypted digital ledger, which we've had for decades on a distributed basis with some protocol to determine how you validate it. And that's highly problematic because the, the key, when, when I look at different uh, coins, uh, the first thing I look at is the governance mechanism. You know, is what is the process or protocol by which a new transaction is validated? Uh, it's one of the problems with Bitcoin, by the way. I mean, Russia could put enough resources behind mining and get 51% of the mining power and create a block that says Vladimir Putin owns all the Bitcoin in the world and you validate the block, at which point Vladimir Putin owns all the Bitcoin in the world. It's, you know, you just need 51% of the mining power. What's what's trustless about that? Um, and so, so it's not that big a deal, but yeah, it is an interesting technology. It has its uses, and I do expect that will expand. So let's flip over to uh, sort of crypto gold. So you have a unit, you know, call it whatever you want, and it represents some weight of gold. It could be an ounce, you know, one unit equals one ounce, it's as, or it could be a kilo, it could be anything you want. And you record the ownership of that on a distributed ledger, and you affiliate with a, you know, maybe a major bank, and you have a debit card, and I put some money in my account, and I fly around the world, and I pay for hotels and planes and dinners or whatever, do some shopping, and you're always debiting my gold account rather than a dollar or euro based account and I can top it up eventually. It sounds convenient. I nothing wrong with it. There are a number of uh, initiatives uh, along these lines. I actually get, you know, quite a few calls from the sponsors about um, you know, endorsements and stuff which I do, which I don't do. I don't do endorsements, but uh but I study it and I watch it very closely. And it is a way to um expand familiarity with and knowledge of gold and uh, millennials, uh, I think, are, are very interested in this. They don't know. They've never been taught gold. If you're a millennial, actually, if you're anyone, uh, you know, younger than I am, and you know anything about gold, you're pretty much self-taught because uh, the university stopped teaching gold in the in, in the mid 1970s, as I mentioned. So I see no harm in it. I think it could do some good. I think it will expand, but um, I don't see why it's different than having a Mastercard and having some physical gold in in a secure place um meaning you can do this yourself this this is something you can do at home uh but but you know having it in third-party storage with a maybe a debit card or some uh, apple pay or some you know transacting transacting mechanism linked to your gold that yeah it sounds convenient so you get the gold exposure and you get the liquidity and the instant use uh, all in one package as opposed to separating the package into, you know, having to go down to the dealer and buy gold and having your MasterCard. Um, so it's convenient. Uh, I think it will grow, but it doesn't seem like that big a deal. This is not, uh, um, this is not some, uh, you know, paradigm shift or uh, revolutionary change. It's, it's more incremental than revolutionary, yeah. I think, is, is how I would put it. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. I, I, something that, that I have just uh, recently um, uh, uh, read from you and I thought it was really interesting was um, when you referred to gold and the SDR, you basically said, in short, world money has now been packed to gold at a rate of 900 SDR to one ounce of gold. It's a new global gold standard using the IMF's world money. There's the global monetary reset right in front of your eyes. I think that's also uh, already um, something that you will describe in your upcoming book. Um, and Jim, 
I, I'm not sure um, um, if, if, if this what you're referring here, uh, Golden SDR is also kind of linked to the crypto SDR that you mentioned in the recent uh, interview, the Gold Chronicles um, uh, with you and, 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 and Alex Stanchik. So, so it would be great if you, if you could explain those thoughts a bit for, for, for our listeners. Sure. So we've got two things on the table. One is uh, pegging gold uh, at a, uh, a price of 900 SDRs per ounce. Uh, and the other one is the crypto SDR. Now, I started writing and talking about the crypto SDR earlier. Uh, so they're, technically, they're separate uh, developments, but they could be expected to converge. Let's just take them separately. Uh, let's just talk about the crypto, R, crypto SDR. One of my... Um, criticisms of cryptocurrencies is that, uh, you know, take a deep breath. You really think that the most powerful people in the world, the global monetary elites, from Mario Draghi to Christine Lagarde to Augustine Carstens to, um, uh, you know, Jay Powell and others, that they are going to allow a bunch of computer geeks to take over money? That's never going to happen. No one gives up power voluntarily. No one gives, I mean, nothing is, you know, May, even armed forces need money to pay their soldiers. I mean, you know, from Napoleon to Julius Caesar, they, you know, Napoleon said an army runs on its uh, stomach, meaning they need food and logistics. They sure do, but uh, you pay for that with money. So uh, you could say that the military runs on money, money's, you know, stored energy, uh, but control of money is the most powerful lever in the world of all the things we're discussing. So do you think the G20 and the BIS and the IMF and the United Nations and other multilateral institutions that, in effect, run the world are actually going to allow um, private money? Of course they won't. So they'll find ways to squash it. They, it was, first, they didn't know anything about it. Then they kind of came up the learning curve. Then it was a novelty. Then it was a threat. And now it's being squashed pretty systematically. However, as is often the case, the power elites co-opt Whatever it is they're trying to crush, they crush it in private hands, but they co-opt it for themselves. So we're now seeing the age of, uh, let's call it government-sponsored cryptos. And the IMF is working on this, and Christine Lagarde has, has spoken about it. Uh, and so what I expect is the IMF will create a distributed ledger. So this is just, you know, you call it blockchain. It's the more, I think, technical or newer term is distributed ledger technology, or DLT. The IMF will create a distributed ledger. Uh, it will be a what's called a permissioned system as opposed to a permissionless system. Uh, Bitcoin is permissionless, which is anybody can play. Permissioned is more like joining a club. You need permission to enter the, the world of those who can share and transact in whatever uh, crypto coin you're talking about. Uh, that's a big deal, by the way, because if you have a trusted group, the governance is a lot easier. You don't need these dopey uh, you know, math problems that you have to solve to create a Bitcoin. Uh, that's using up you know, more electricity than the country of Ireland at the moment. It's another reason Bitcoin's not going anywhere, not sustainable, environmentally damaging. But um, so you don't have those big kind of, I guess they dopey because they're trivial, but use a lot of computing power math problems. You, it's much easier to transact. So you have, you now have 189 members. That is the membership of the IMF um, in a permissioned uh, distributed encrypted blockchain uh, distributed ledger denominated in SDRs, which makes the SDR a lot easier to move around. Today, it's very clunky. There's only one, uh, there's really not a private market. There's not a deep liquid uh, bond market in SDRs. All these things are merging, but they're not really there yet. Um, you know, by the way, China buys SDRs in the secondary market. Um, I'm going to just give you a simple example. The IMF just bailed out Argentina. Everyone said they got a $50 billion loan. Well, it, it wasn't a $50 billion loan. It was an SDR loan. But, I, of course, Argentina needs dollars. So Argentina was able to swap the SDRs. They signed an SDR note with the IMF uh, and got SDR credits at the IMF. But they were able to swap those with dollars. But who's the swap counterparty? Well, uh, it's not transparent. We don't know exactly. But highly likely it was China. We know that China's buying SDRs in the secondary market because if you look at China's official reserves, which are available from the PBOC, and look at how many SDRs they have, and then go back and look at the IMF allocations over time and look at how many SDRs they gave to China. China has more than they were given by the IMF, which means they, they had to get the excess somewhere else, and they got them in the secondary market. There's a secret trading desk inside the IMF, which is how you do this. Well, if all of a sudden you had a secure, encrypted, distributed ledger, it would be a lot easier 
uh, for these things to fly around. So that's coming. That will be the platform for the new world money. Uh, so, and then they're also encouraging market SDRs, private SDRs, and all that. Goldman Sachs is involved. So let's take all that and put it to one side. That's coming anyway. Now we have this other development, which is quite new, and I want to be uh, fair. This was called to my attention by a correspondent named D. H. Bauer uh, in Switzerland, and uh, uh, I haven't met. Uh, by the way, I've corresponded with D. H. Bauer. Uh, but I actually don't know if he's a man or a woman, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just say DHB. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we haven't met. I don't want to say him because maybe it is a maybe it is a woman scholar in Switzerland. So I actually don't know. We haven't met, but it doesn't matter. But again, I think about uh, the dollar price of gold all the time, and I'm actually enough of a geek that I think about the dollar price of SDRs all the time. I'm I'm on the IMF mailing list. I get daily pricing reports. I'm quite familiar with it. I had not thought about the SDR price of gold. So I, I think of dollar gold and I think of dollar SDR, but it's simple transitive property. It's not, it's not difficult to get to SDR gold. I hadn't thought about it because there is no SDR market in gold. You don't call your dealer and say, hey, I want to buy some gold for SDRs. Um, but the, through a transitive property, that number exists. I just, it's just not something I had thought about. And, and again, D.H. Bauer uh, called this to my attention. Uh, but what I did, I replicated the research. I saw the chart. I almost fell off my chair. I said, no, this can't be true. There's got to be uh, something wrong here. But there wasn't. I, again, I, the data is available. You can, as I say, you can do this at home. And uh, uh, it totally bore out what um, DHB was saying. And you see this in your chart. You know, there's global monetary reset already happening. You have to go to the far uh, right-hand side of the chart. Uh, and it, you, you, it would be, you know, you might want to throw in a vertical line on October 1st, 2016. Uh, but yeah, I think any viewer can see about where that is. Um, October 1st, 2016 was the day that the Chinese Yuan was admitted to the SDR basket. Now people say, oh, the SDR is backed by this basket of currency. It isn't. It's not backed by anything. But it does have a dollar value, and the dollar value is calculated with reference to those uh, currencies. It used to be four, uh, dollar, euro, sterling, and uh, Japanese yen. And now it's five. It's those four plus the Chinese yuan. The, but that sort of narrow range, the, the draw a trend line through the right-hand side of your graph, again, just the last, um, you know, the last little bit from October 1st, 2016, you'll see two things. Number one, uh, the trend line is flat. It's not going anywhere. Number two, it's in a very tight band between 850 and 950 SDRs per ounce. And that band is getting tighter. It's, it's now... It's really tightened to kind of 875 to 925. Now, uh, how could you do this? Uh, first of all, who, who could, if, if that's the peg, and that, that's what the data shows. And I want to I throw some caution in here. Number one, this is not official. Uh, my estimate is that China is doing this. Uh, I think there are only four parties in the world that could do it, U.S. Treasury, ECB, uh, China, through the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, so-called safe. Not through the People's Bank of China, by the way. That's for show. That's the shop window. Behind the curtain in the back room, the, the, the money in China is run by um, SAFE, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. It's run by an ex-PIMCO guy, by the way. It's very, very sophisticated. They, they really know what they're doing. Um, and then uh, the IMF itself. So those are the, you know, it's like a you know, Her Hercule Poirot mystery. You know, those, those are the yeah. four suspects. Um, they can pretty quickly eliminate the U.S. and ECB because they are more transparent. You would see, if they were doing up market operations in gold, you would see it. And you don't see it. So put them to one side. Uh, the IMF, uh, they're not ready for this. Uh, they could do it. But uh, again, there's no consensus in the IMF. So through a process of elimination, uh, it, my inference is that is China. And I think that's the most likely suspect in any case. Um, you don't need SDRs to, to do this open market operation in gold SDR. You can use the basket. In other words, the SDR is kind of a derivative. Uh, but you can transact in the currencies themselves, and you can manipulate the dollar price of the SDR. So on the one hand, you can manipulate gold. You can manipulate the dollar price of gold. On the other hand, by intervening in the foreign currency markets, you can, inter you can uh, uh, manipulate the dollar price of the um, SDR. Well, if I can manipulate the dollar price of gold and I can manipulate the dollar price of the SDR, then it's easy to manipulate the SDR price of gold. And that's what appears to be happening. Now, another interesting footnote. 
because uh, you know I think listeners know that I forecast and I continue to forecast ten thousand dollar per ounce gold in the intermediate term, and I've explained that that's not pulled out of a hat. That's not. I'm just. I'm not trying to get attention or publicity. I don't care. It's it's the math. It's the implied non-deflationary price of gold in a system where you have to back global M1 with 40% gold. I use 40% because that's historically more than enough to have a, a viable gold standard. I use global M1 because that's the global money supply, and uh, I use 33,000 tons because that's the official gold supply, not counting not counting you know the 150,000 tons. Um, uh, owned by private citizens. So taking those inputs, you very quickly get to $10,000 per ounce gold. But let's apply the same logic to the IMF. How much gold does the IMF have? It's about 2,400 tons, give or take. Um, how many uh, SDRs are out there? Uh, well, there's several hundred billion. Uh, and so if you take those numbers, and I, I, don't have the, uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, I've given approximations, but if you take the exact numbers, and they are available, and do the division, and use the 40% metric that I described, guess what the implied non-deflationary price of gold in SDRs is? It's 900. In other yeah. words, yeah. The, nine, the 900 came from the time series, but when you do the gold uh, SDR ratio using 40%, what's called cover, you get to 900. So there's something big going on here. Uh, all of it non-transparent. I'm, I'm using inferential method. I'm using Bayesian statistics. Uh, I'm using the best uh, tools I can find. But it is right in front of us, and it looks like there is this uh, global monetary reset. Very powerful forecasting tool, by the way. A, a week or so ago when um, it was running at, I'm, I'm keeping my own time series now, but it was running at uh, about uh, 884. And if uh, if the range is 875 to 925, that was a screaming buy signal. And sure enough, gold popped the next day. So we have a nice trading tool here as well. And you probably know which, which government or which state has got by far the highest uh, gold backing of its uh, M0 money supply. It is the country where the World Cup is happening at the moment. It's, it's, it's Russia. <laughs> Um, with uh, 54 uh, 54 percent gold coverage at the moment, it's it's, it's really astonishing how they built right. the gold reserve the last uh, couple of years, and probably not a coincidence that um, they just dumped 50 percent of the U.S. Treasury holdings. Although one have to say one has to say that it's 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 been like only 50 billion, so it it, it wasn't that much uh, of an absolute amount, but it it, it is definitely a, a step statement from I think uh, I think Vladimir, yeah I think Vladimir Putin is the first world leader to escape the Roach Motel uh, which is dollar hegemony that we talked about earlier he's out of the system he's ready for the next phase and it could involve a, um, a crypto coin uh, called a Putin coin or a Xi coin but I talked about the IMF permissions uh, distributed ledger well there's uh, probably another development is China Russia Turkey this new axis of gold could come up with their own distributed ledger heavily encrypted, that they run uh, with a uh, called a Putin coin or Xi coin uh, to settle balance of payments, backed ultimately by gold. You wouldn't have to move gold around every day. You could do a quarterly or once a year once you net everything out. And you're, at that point, you're out of the dollar system. By the way, I speak to people at the Pentagon and the U.S. Treasury, um, Federal Reserve officials. I'm, you know, I'm a loyal American. I want the best for America. I am... Um, trouble that uh, people in official circles don't see what we're talking about. We're talking about here with great specificity, not, you know, kind of hysterically making up scenarios. These are, Everything we're talking about is from an IMF published report, from publicly available data, a little bit of inference behind it, but not much of a stretch. So it is right in front of our eyes, but the U.S. government seems blind to it. Well, um we're coming to the to the final part of our discussion. Uh, we have touched a lot of uh, macro uh, politics, um, geopolitics, of course. So let's come to 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 gold and briefly discuss gold and 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 its portfolio characteristics. And uh, what we can see here is, uh, I think this. 
um, perfectly relates to 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 the com to the previous comments. Um, actually, the world gold price is rising already since 2014, end of 2013. Um, but in dollar terms, um, we are in this bull market that nobody is 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 really um, seeing. Already since the beginning of 2016, we're seeing uh, higher lows. Um, and we should not forget that uh, last year in dollar terms, uh, when I talk to investors, uh, nobody is really, really interested uh, in gold at the moment. So the, 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 the sentiment feels like gold is dead. But in dollar terms, gold was up 14%. Of course, we're seeing an extremely high correlation between uh, the dollar and gold at the moment. It seems that it's mostly a, a, a dollar play at the moment, but th that might, of course, change. But but I think what's what's really important to say is that this is a bull market in the making. It's an early stage of a new bull market, and it's um, – an asset class or currency, whatever, um, that nobody is interested in at the moment. Uh, I, I think it's really, um, we, 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 we tweeted that out a couple of times uh, last, last couple of days. Um, the sentiment is as negative as it can get. We have seen um, very, very positive developments uh, uh, on the futures market based on the commitment of traders report. Sentiment is extremely negative. So, so that might probably uh, a very, might be a very, very good entry point at the moment. Now, um, as, as you know, Jim, we, we um, uh, like having a look at relative charts, at ratio charts, because I think that gives you much more information um, than absolute charts at the moment, because everything is so much distorted by central banks. And on the relative basis, of course, you can see that compared to, to the equity market, um, Commodities are, are dirt cheap at the moment. We know that um, markets tend to mean revert. So if there is some mean reversion happening, um, I think commodities and especially the precious metals should be a really, really um, uh, good idea. Well, I agree this is a very uh, good entry point for gold. Again, gold's had a, a bit of a tough slog. Um, recently, but I uh, I take your point, Ronnie, and I agree completely. You can't get to um, let your portfolio allocation decision making be too affected by what's happened over you know a, a week or a month. You know the, the behavioral psychologists have a name for that. It's called recency bias. We tend to be over influenced by things that have happened most recently and lose our uh, perspective on the uh, on the longer view. And again, I go back to um, uh, the December. 2015 low. Uh, we are, in my view, in a, in a long multi-year bull market, which has very far to run. It will get to uh, what I expect to be a $10,000 per ounce price. Uh, who, who knows about the SDR price? Let's let's stay tuned on that. That has huge implications, by the way. Just to, I, I want to take the our SDR discussion and put it in the context of what you're uh, asking, Ronnie, which is the um, the outlook for gold and commodities in general. Um, there are sort of two ways for this to play out. If if China wants to peg the SDR to peg gold to the SDR at 900 SDRs, it, you know, right now, if the SDR were the only currency in the world, of course it's not. But if it were, they would have enough gold to make that stick. But what's going to happen in a new financial crisis if if the central banks are tapped out? If you can't go to QE4, QE5, and QE6 because you're in danger of expanding your balance sheet into the, you know, maybe the $10 trillion level, which point I think you probably pass invisible confidence boundary and destroy confidence in the dollar itself. If the SDR is the only source of liquidity in that scenario, then how does that stack up against the peg of 900 SDRs to an ounce of gold? Well, there are two answers. Number one, it doesn't, that you pick the wrong price and you've got to uh, let the SDR value go up to uh, you know eight thousand or eight thousand SDRs or whatever something equivalent to ten thousand dollars, or you'll say, hey, here we are, IMF, we got all the SDRs you want. You have to give us gold. You know, you can get your SDR liquidity, but you have to give us gold 
if you want it. Uh, at which point, what does the United States do? Does the United States open up the vault of Fort Knox and say, okay, here's, here's a couple thousand tons of gold, you leverage two and a half to one, give us some SDRs because we're broke. I mean, th these are all down the road scenarios, but it, it will play out in one of these ways because there are no other ways out. The U.S. simply cannot pay its debts. Um, and you don't have to. The U.S. has never, uh, with the exception of one year, 1835, during the administration of Andrew Jackson, the U.S. has never paid off the national debt. What we are good at is rolling it over. Uh, but rolling it over depends on confidence, and confidence is being destroyed because the fiscal situation in the U.S. is totally out of control. Uh, and so there are only two ways out. Default, which is not going to happen because we can print dollars. The other one is uh, inflation. Well, if you see the inflation coming, uh, you want gold. Uh, because gold is the ultimate inflation hedge. And so, I, you know, you can talk about an SDR peg, you can talk about breaking the SDR peg and, and hyperinflating SDRs, you can talk about hyperinflating in dollars, you can talk about a depression, which I think we're in anyway, and you made the point earlier that gold does very well in recessions. Some people don't understand that, but just go back to the Great Depression, 1929 to 1933. I mean, the by a lot of definitions, the Great Depression lasted until 1940, and I agree with that. But the most acute phase was that 1929 to 1933 period. Uh, gold went up 75% from $20 an ounce uh, to $35 an ounce. Um, in other words, gold performs extremely well in depressions and severe recessions. And there's a reason for it, which is countries are desperate to get inflation, and there's no faster way to get inflation than to devalue your currency against gold, and therefore gold goes up in nominal dollar space. Uh, best performing stock on the on the New York Stock Exchange during the Great Depression was home stake mining. Yeah. Uh, so, so you do have this evidence that gold does very well in inflation. Everyone knows that intuitively, but the evidence is that gold does very well in deflation, at least extreme deflation, because governments are desperate to get out. Uh, and the U.S. is going to have to have inflation because there's no other way to pay the debt. So, every way I look at it. Gold goes up. Now, does that mean tomorrow? Not necessarily, but if it's depressed right now, what a great time to buy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just just constantly accumulate. And we're actually already um, coming to the final slides. What we can see here, gold as a, as a pretty good um, safe haven buy, uh, how it performed in local currencies uh, versus the local stock market. Of course, uh, in U.S. dollar basis, uh, it, it was doing okay, up 6%, uh, while the S&P was down 38%. But in some other uh, currencies, like the Canadian Looney, for example, up 30%, um, while the stock market was down 35%, uh, even more extreme in Russia, and so on. So, so I think that's, that's also a, a message that is really important from our gold report. We don't, we don't want people to allocate all their capital into gold, but it just makes sense from a portfolio perspective to at least hold some gold. And that already brings us to your, to our, um, scenarios for the gold price that we are also describing in the, uh, gold report. Um, Mark, this is something that, that, that you're really good, uh, uh talking about, uh, our, our, uh, scenarios that we're thinking about. Yeah, I can finish up this uh, very interesting call um, by describing the thoughts which we put into the scenarios and we defined the scenarios um, in terms of time horizon as, as this um, administration. So by the end of 2020, we are talking about these, uh, these price ranges for, for different scenarios. Why did we choose this one? Because we think also not only that the, that the administration is in power till 2020, most probably at least, um, at, le um, at least till 2020, um, the monetary normalization, which is obviously very important for the gold price, perhaps we can get a grip on if this monetary normalization really was able to be done by then, and uh, because by then we we should be kind of in a more more uh, normal whatever that means um, balance sheet uh, at, at at least according to the path which the Fed uh, has entered. So scenario A would be in our in our view it would require a genuine boom 
with real growth, which is uh, larger than 3% per annum, which then again allows the Fed to really follow through the, the monetary normalization. And at the end of this phase, uh, they can say, okay, success, balance sheet is between, say, 1.5 and 2.5 trillion US dollars. It was basically normalized. That obviously wouldn't be a very good uh, scenario for gold. We estimate something like 700 to 1,000 uh, price range. Obviously, we see a lot of risk to this scenario because we think the, the this um, tightening, as we discussed, is, is, is actually already the risk of um, this, uh, for, for this genuine boom and genuine growth scenario. Scenario B, this is basically where we are right now, I'd say. We are still muddling through. Um, we have growth and inflation rates between 1.5 and 3 uh, percent. Until now, we haven't completed the, the monetary normalization. Actually, that's also the, the, the price range where we are uh, still in uh, today. So that's uh, 1,000 to 1,400 US dollar price tag we put on this scenario. Uh, and then the more likely scenarios in our view would be either scenario C, perhaps we can get really an inflationary boom, growth, and inflation is greater than 3%. Um, that probably will mean that monetary normalization will not be able to be completed by 2020. Um, which brings us in a price, price range uh, of 1400 to 2300 That's what we estimate. Or, and this is scenario D, this could be an adverse scenario. So, so we can either have a growth uh, which is very meager or even a, a, a contraction, a recession, um, which most probably will um, lead the Fed to pause the normalization or even to renew easing. And then, then that range gets really broad, then really a lot of different um, outcomes are possible. One of these adverse scenarios would also be, I, I would uh, suggest, something we talked about today as well, being um, a, a, some kind of a reset of the monetary system. Um, so, so this this are uh, this is what we are really putting actually together 18 months ago, I think, or, or 16 months ago, uh, and we we stuck to 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 these uh, scenarios again, going to looking looking at end of 2020. Any final comments on that, Jim? Well, um, no, I think it was very well, uh, very well stated, uh, Mark, and uh, very thorough. I agree with the analysis. Uh, I, I especially like the way you've got different scenarios rather than forecasting one outcome. You said, well, there are a number of outcomes, but here's how gold could be expected to perform in each one. So I, I, that's a much more um, helpful and realistic way of uh, doing forecasting than putting a stake in the ground. And uh, as far as my forecast of uh, uh, Ten thousand dollar gold is concerned. I always point out, well, you got to you have to get to five thousand or two thousand or even <laughs> fourteen hundred before you get to ten thousand. So I don't uh, disagree with any of the forecasts. Well, Jim, thank you very very much um, for taking the time. Um, I think it's been a really fascinating discussion again. Um, yeah, thank you for for being member of our advisory board. Thank you for being a friend and also uh, a mentor. Uh, we really appreciate it, uh, also your kind comments about the report, and we're already truly looking forward to your upcoming book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim, and I hope you listeners all enjoyed it. Um, you can find the download link to this year's In Gold We Trust report uh, below, and yeah, thank you for, very much for taking the time. Take care.